to shake it out. Yeah, let's see. Let's see. and just trying to, to have dialogue. Uh, so we'd love to talk to you, um, to find out more about your story. And you know, we, we're, we are on a, a, a quest for truth. Uh, I hope you know, these guys are on a quest for truth. We all want to believe what is true. And so we're not, gonna, uh, we're not going to find, uh, if, if we're living in an echo chamber, right, we're not going to be able to be challenged in our views. And so we want to be challenged. And um, this is not a debate. This is hopefully a discussion. And lots of times we'll be like, I don't know, it's a good question. I need to think about that. And you know, we're not trying to, to play gotcha. We're just trying to have a good discussion because this stuff really does matter so uh super excited to um to have uh you know much, uh, kind of an all-star team sort of from uh from the other side and then you know our, our motley crew over here. <laughs> 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 we'll see as we grow but um you'll know, we'll all introduce ourselves um what we decide kind of the format we'll introduce ourselves and tell why we hold the position that we do why and that our faith in christ has had an incredibly valuable influence on our lives and that's what we share and to get up and dispute with one another over that would be foolish we differ in some beliefs but i'm going to tell you about an old lady in my word in my word anna mendez anna couldn't have formulated a theology or made a theological argument if her life depended on it but she'll make it to heaven long before me she was so wonderful such a wonderful person it's not necessary to have theological acumen in order to be saved or exalted or to be judged righteous. If that's the requirement there, and if, if the requirement is that you have a perfectly proper and truthful theology in every respect, I suspect the number of people in heaven is going to be very, very, very small. Um, that said, I was a practicing attorney for 38 years. Um, I did litigation, constitutional litigation. I represented the LDS Church for 10 years. And I have taught philosophy and philosophical theology at University of Utah, BYU, Utah State, and lectured at Notre Dame and Yale. And so I've had a lot of dialogues like this one that I think are valuable. They're valuable because we get to share what's valuable to us. And so why am I LDS? It's very easy, really. My parents were LDS. <laughs> and so it was a live option for me. A live option, as William James would put it, is something that we could actually consider as something that is actually believable. No, I if, I, if I were born in China, if I were born in India, it probably would not have been a live option. It would have been foreclosed to me as something I would have been interested in. And so maybe the happenstance of my birth has something to do with it, okay? In addition, at age 14, um, trust me, at that time, I was a lot more likely to go out and race motorcycles than I was to go to church. <laughs> and that's because it was a lot more enjoyable. And, but I had a question. If this is true, that is, if the LDS Church is true, I better find out. If it's not true, I don't want to spend even 10 seconds with it because it's not worth it. But if it is true, it's the most amazing thing that's ever been claimed. At 14, that's how I thought about it. And so I studied everything I could. I put, picked up a book of Revelations from Joseph Smith and began to read it. And about the third day of reading it dawned on me that my life was not in accordance with anything I was reading. And so I knelt down and asked God to forgive me of my sins. Now, at 14, I wasn't very original at seeming, and I wasn't very good at it, but I had a few. <laughs> and after the prayer, I felt like somebody had taken a scrubbing brush and scrubbed me from the inside out. I knew that I'd been forgiven. And I knelt down beside my bed and thanked God, and then I began to read again. And as I read, my heart burned within me. 
my mind was open and I saw very clearly. And I knew that what I was reading was true and that it was of God. And that changed the course of my life. I was only 14. Since that time, I've had more than enough time to think about it. And I'm just going to tell you that, for instance, reading Third Nephi in the Book of Mormon in the visit of Christ, the most intimate, majestic, incredible presentation. And as I read that, it was like I was there. I could feel it in every part of me. I'm so thankful for that. I'm so thankful for a Savior. I'm so thankful that I had those experiences. Um, it's really quite that simple. Um, yeah, I've studied a lot of theology and a lot of philosophy, but at the end of the day, I'm pretty sure there's a lot I don't get right. Forgive me for that. I'm sure God will, because he knows that we're all a little bit dumb when it comes to all these kind of things, right? Because as I was saying to someone earlier, when we get to heaven, it's going to be like, I, I, I read about going to Japan once. And I haven't been there yet, but I have been to Europe. And I read about going to Europe before I got there. And there was nothing about <coughs> what I read about, okay? The intimate personal experience of it was completely different, so much greater in depth. I suspect that's what it's going to be like when we finally get to the other side and get to see what things are actually like. Thank you. Look forward to having a discussion with you. Hi, uh, I'm Spencer Marsh. Um, I, I admit that I'm, a, I'm very humbled to be here right now. Um, I'm sitting next to two intellectual titans. I am not an intellectual titan like them. Um, I'm something of, a, something of a novice, but I aim to kind of walk in their footsteps a little bit. Um, I was born and raised here in Salt Lake City. In, in Salt Lake City. Um, I served a mission for the church beginning in Guatemala City and then finishing my mission in California. And uh, upon returning from California, I experienced what I can, I can describe as a very acute and, and prolonged intellectual faith crisis. Um, I have had an extensive involvement in Latter-day Saint apologetics and um, the study of Latter-day Saint philosophy and theology, uh, um, most of which has come from this man right here, actually, um, seated, to my, seated to my left. Um, and, uh, but obviously, there's a number of different writer, uh, writers, obviously, and I am to, to contribute to, to something of that. Um, the, the reason that I am a Latter-day Saint, um, well, I wish I had much more, much, more than, uh, much more than the time allotted to explain why I'm a Latter-day Saint, but I think that it can basically be boiled down to one thing, and that is that um, the claims of Joseph Smith are so bold and audacious, and they're substantiated by some of the most profound works of revelation and scripture that I believe that the world has ever known. Um, the more that you study the Book of Mormon, yes, you'll find you'll find some uh, you'll find some bumps on its surface, but uh, you're not you're not going to know the treasure beneath it until you really start to dig into it, and you won't know the light of Christ quite like quite like you would want to, I think, without experiencing the Book of Mormon and experiencing it at that depth, um, at the depth that it was meant to be uh, that it was meant to be explored at, um, and you will especially not know it if you do not have an experience with the Holy Ghost that I have had, um, witnessing to my heart, imprinting it on my heart forever that it is true. I've tried to explain that spiritual witness away in a number of, in a number of ways uh, over the years. I've, ha I've heard other explanations for why that spiritual witness came and, and, uh, what, it and what it provided me, but none have really proved persuasive to me. The more that I study Joseph Smith, the more that I study the Book of Mormon, the more I'm convinced that the Latter-day Saint vision is one of love. And it is love that is at the core of our beings, and it is love that ultimately is, is the truth that all of us are looking that all of us are all of us are looking for, or seeking to understand, and seeking to apply uh, to the fullest extent possible. And uh, that's that's my piece. I'm Spencer Marsh. Well, it's a pleasure to be able to address you today. Uh, my name is Robert Bonham. Uh, if you're willing to watch with a funky accent, I'm not from Utah, I'm actually from the southwest of Ireland. Uh, so I've traveled a bit to, uh, to be here today. But uh, joking aside, uh, I'm a Latter-day Saint. Um, I have, in terms of my educational background, I have degrees in anthropology and theology. Uh, the theology degree was actually from a Roman Catholic seminary, uh, the Pontifical University of Ireland in Newt. Uh, 
Um, and I have a background in LDS uh, studies. I work as a historian for a group called the B.H. Roberts Foundation. And I'm also a publisher of LDS um, apologist as well, if you're ever familiar with the uh, website, Scriptural Mormonism. <laughs> um, so why am I a Latter-day Saint? Well, there's a number of reasons why I'm a Latter-day Saint. I do believe that Mormonism, quote unquote, has a very compelling Christology, anthropology, and a whole facet of theology when properly understood. Um, and some of it will be coming out in the various segments today, particularly soteriology and the nature of God. I do also believe that the more one studies this, and I, um, the Book of Mormon is what it claims to be, a 19th century English translation of an ancient Near Eastern and Mesoamerican text. But ultimately, the real reason why I'm a Latter-day Saint, I'm also a former Roman Catholic, uh, if you're not familiar with the educational background, is to borrow from a uh, reformed confession, if you will, so I can be a bit ecumenical today, uh, one's full persuasion and assurance of the truth of Mormonism and the Book of Mormon and so forth is from the inward Holy Spirit bearing witness by and with the word in one's heart. Um, Pines, if you actually know which confession that come is uh, paraphrasing. So ultimately, I'm not having saying because God, through his Holy Spirit, testifies to my knowledge. But there's other reasons as well, some of which will come out here, including theological reasons, like a very compelling Christology, soteriology, and anthropology. And I look forward to dialoguing with you on these. Um, See the awesome people as well. <laughs> <laughs> hey, everybody. Um, I'd like to think I'm an intellectual titan, but there's no chance at all. So we, uh, we appreciate everybody coming out. Um, I'm, Matt McGrew, I'm Matthew McGrew. I'm a Rashi of Christie intern. Shout out to all the 29 year old interns out there. I'm proud of it. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, but no, yeah, I mean, well, one of the things that we want to do is, is have like, like some of the things I was saying, just just we want to have conversations, right? The verse that comes to mind is when you know the, the love is patient, love is kind, you know, that gets shared at every wedding, you know. But th but there's a phrase in there that says love doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices at the truth, right? And why is that important? Is that we want to have the I want to have the closest relationship with God ever, right? And how do we do that? I'm married to my wife. The more I get to know her, the more I'm in love with her. Same with God. The more we get to know Him the more we get to you know, fall deeper and deeper in love with them. And so the beautiful thing is you guys, the audience, get to hear us talk about similarities, talk about differences, and you get to evaluate those similarities or differences and, and to what you think, you know, how much weight you put in differences or how much weight you put in similarities. And so it'll, it'll be really good to go through that. But a little bit about myself, you know, I, I, same thing, I grew up an evangelical Christian. My parents were, that's why I was, same thing. You know, but at, at some point, you know, we're all in this story of, you know, we go through life, we stumble. Um, so for me, you know, I made a profession of faith around eight years old, you know, I was baptized and, and journeyed on, you know, but I didn't really ever have community my age. You know, my relationship with God was one, you know, middle school, high school, and college where I was just, I, I felt like he was so disappointed with me. And that was because of sin in my life. The biggest sin struggle that I had was pornography, you know, high school and college. It just, you know, it's, it's super addicting, you know, and it's, it just, it, it's, it, but it's sin and it, 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 you know, weighs on you. And, and so my viewpoint of how God looked at me was one of just utter disappointment, one of utter disgust. You know, I, I didn't feel like God really loved me, you know, and when I was in, in college, it was amazing. I, I, you know, me and a buddy were going through this book um, on how to meditate on scripture and, and pray through scripture, journal scripture, and it was super impactful. And the verse of that day was, for while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And it just hit me like the first time, like I just read that and I realized while I was a sinner, while I'm in sin, Christ looked at me, loved me, wants relationship with me, promises me eternal life. And I just realized that God wants us to have rest. He wants us to have security and rest that's found in him. And it changed my, my walk. It changed my relationship when I knew, not that I had to come to him and, and clean myself up, which is what I thought I had to do. I was like, man, I'm, I got to get rid of this sin. If I do, then God will truly love me. And it wasn't that at all. It was the moment I realized that he actually did love me just unconditionally was the moment that that sin started. I, I think I saw it for what it was. It was like, that is not as good as what God has for me. And because of that, you know, that sin really did, you know, that specific sin, you know, I got to see with God overcome that. And hey, but still today, I sin all the time, right? You know, I mean, Jesus' standard is, is, is very high, right? You got pornography, but then Jesus goes, if you look at a woman with lustful intent, you've committed adultery in your heart, you know? And so my life is, is still full of sin, but it's so different now because I can rest that I, because of Christ, death, burial, resurrection, 
I am dead to sin and alive in Christ. And I can promise that he'll never leave me or forsake me and I will have eternal life in him. And so that's a little bit about why I'm an evangelical Christian. And I just want to, sh- it changed my life. And I just want to share that news with everyone else. So. Uh, my name is Jane Cantic. I was born and raised in the country of California. Uh, moved here in 2021 um, to do work with Rosho Christie. So um, I grew up Roman Catholic, so we have something in common, right? Um, so I was um, in the Catholic Church up until about 21. You know, I was baptized in the church, I went to catechism, had my first communion, was confirmed when I was about 17. And so that's the only thing I ever really knew. Um, my family was Catholic. Uh, if, you know, if you know anything about the Philippines, um, the Philippines was colonized by the Spanish and they brought Catholicism to them. And so you know, for generations, my family has been Catholic. Um, so I had went away to college and God had done a work in my family. Uh, my, my dad had become an evangelical Christian, my mom and my younger brother. And I came home and I was like, wait, why aren't we going to the Catholic church? What's going on here? Um, so um, they brought me on a journey with them. But at the time, I was away at college. So you know what college is. Like, you're away from home. You're experiencing life. You're partying. Uh, my faith was kind of on the back burner for a while. And I got to a point where I didn't know who I was anymore. I didn't know uh, what my life was for. I, I didn't have purpose or meaning. I was kind of depressed because my, my identity was always in my accomplishments. And so when I saw my life wasn't going where I wanted it to be, I was like, I don't know what I'm doing with myself. So in uh, December of, you know, you're going to figure out how old I am. <laughs> December of 2000 and it was one. I was 21 and I was just like, I, I don't know what to do with my life. Um, my younger brother and my uh, mom invited me to this youth conference. And for the first time in my life, I think I actually heard the gospel of what Christ has done on the cross. Because all my life, it was about doing good things, being a good person. And uh, I wasn't ever sure of my salvation. I was always scared that God might just judge me or strike me dead because I did something wrong. So I, I lived more in fear of God rather than in his love. And so at 21, I came to faith and asked God for forgiveness. and. Um, yeah, my life was changed, and since then I've been living my life for Christ, and because I came to know him in college, uh, there's just so many questions that college students have, and I think that's why I work for Asho Christi, because a lot of people are losing faith, looking for faith, and um, that's what we're here for. We're here to walk alongside people who are looking for truth, looking for God, looking for meaning and purpose in their life, and so I'm a Christian because Jesus Christ saved me. Uh, my name is Aaron Marshall. Uh, I was uh, not raised, I'm, I'm from the South, I'm from uh, Virginia. I used to have an accent, but I've been here for a while, so it's kind of gone away a little bit. But whenever I go home, I pick it back up, and you'll, see, you'll, hear, you'll hear some y'alls in there sometimes tonight. Uh, but grew up in Virginia in the Bible Belt, uh, we call it the buckle of the Bible Belt, but um, didn't grow up in a, in a religious household at all. My, uh, my dad's uh, still not a believer, and um, I, I, I was... Um, I, there was, you know, something missing in my life, you know, similar to, you, you're here, some messed up people over here, just, you know, chasing, and, but I, at the time, uh, in college, I started dating uh, this girl, and she was a Christian, and her mom was a little upset that she was dating me, and, but she started inviting me to their uh, family functions, and on trips and stuff, and she would just share the gospel with me, she would tell me about what Jesus had done for me, and she would tell me about that they loved me, and that I could have an, a secure identity, and Jesus, and so uh, I remember where I was, where I was when I was driving. I was driving from Richmond to Charlottesville. I remember I remember on the road even right now. Uh, it was a long time ago. I won't give the date, but uh, a long time ago uh, when I gave my life to Jesus. Uh, then the, my twenties were uh, kind of a disaster. I went to law school, which is probably part of the disaster. Uh, but uh, went to law school and was basically indoctrinated into you know some, lots of bad thinking. Out of law school, I worked for an atheist criminal defense attorney and was just sort of imbibing that theology, lots of sin, and really just running from God. I was reading atheist literature. And I remember um, just God really just mercifully brought me to the end of myself, and I was sitting in um, the house I was living at the time, and 
depressed, I was an alcoholic, and uh, just really was suicidal, and just, it felt like God was telling me, I had enough, can we, can we stop this now? And I, I so I, you know, I, things changed, and I recognized, I knew that um, the problem was my sin, and I knew who I was in Jesus, but I had all these questions, especially, you know, law school, they talking to doubt all these things, and all these questions, and so there was a, this was in North Carolina, there was a, a seminary there at the time that had put out a home study apologetics course, and apologetics just means to give a defense, and so there were questions like, can we know what's true? And are there objective, is there an objective truth in the world? And all these things that I've been taught in law school was not true. Uh, but I was really intrigued because I was, I had trusted in Jesus and I, you know, but I just didn't think that that was something that would be true for everybody. And so this law, this took this uh, apologetics course over the course of two months, three months, and just changed my eternity. You know, it, it got transformed by the renewing of my mind, Romans 12. And I read this is true, um, that this really is true for all people, all times, all places, that my identity can be secure in Jesus despite all of my sin. And uh, I really wanted to share that news with um, college students so they wouldn't be as messed up as uh, you know, I was when I was in college. And that's when I got involved with Russia Christie. And, uh, we, um, and, and we ended up moving out here. The president of Russia Christie actually grew up uh, Latter-day Saint. His name's Corey Miller and um, is now a uh, Protestant, but uh, came out here with him in 2018. And uh, now we are, you know, we're here for uh, the rest of our lives. So um, excited to be here, and um, you know, just love to talking talking about Jesus. And so get excited to do that tonight. All right. So the so the format that's going to we talked about is we'll start with the topic of who is God, you know, kind of in our uh, religious traditions. And so we'll start. Um, we'll share for five minutes, and then uh, they'll ask us, you know, a, a question or. You know, one or two, and then then they'll do the same, and, and then we'll do that. So, um, yeah. So we'll start. So uh, I got to put my eyeballs on to see because I'm old. Uh, all right. So who is God? Uh, as far as what we, uh, you know, best we understand, we're going to say like this is what we think the Bible teaches, and we think reality. Uh, God is the uncaused first cause, right? The, the creator and sustainer of all things. He is creator. He's not. Created, He is infinite. He is self-existent. He is without origin. Colossians 1. He, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He never changes. Uh, Malachi 3. I, the Lord, do not change. We'd say God is the ground of all being in knowledge in goodness, that those things are not outside of him, that he is the ground of all those things, and we have all those things because of our participation in him. He is omnipotent. Uh, Psalm 33 says, By the word of the Lord, uh, the, heavy were, uh, the heavens were made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He, he is all-powerful. Uh, we believe in what's called creation ex nihilo. So there was nothing and then, except for God, and then God created everything. Uh, we'd say he is omniscient, meaning he is all-knowing. Isaiah 46, 9, which is uh, just a great verse. I am God, and there is no other. And then he says, I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. So we say he is all-knowing and knows all things that will happen. He is omnipresent, right? He is everywhere. We'd say because he is spirit, he is not a physical being. <clears throat> Maybe most of all, we say that God is love. We see this in John 4, 8. God is love. Now, why is God love? And that's what we would say. It's because he is Trinity. Um, he, for eternity past, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, there's only one God, but the way God exists is three person. And that three persons of the Trinity has existed in perfect community with himself. And that's why there can be love. That's why God is love. I know that's hard for people to understand or to think about the Trinity. But the idea is we see this uh, throughout the Bible. The Shema in Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Right? There's only one God. But then we see throughout Scripture the Father is God. Jesus is God, the Holy Spirit is God. Think about John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word here is Jesus. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So we see the Father, we see the Son. Uh, the Holy Spirit is God. In Acts 5, uh, Luke compares lying to the Holy Spirit to lying to God. So we see 
Clearly, we think we see from the Bible that there's only one God, but the one God that does exist exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that's why we think the Trinity is so important, because He is love. So I don't know if you guys wanted to add anything to that. Or... Uh, sure, yeah. So in the Godhead, we believe there is three persons. So we believe that the Trinity gives us the best explanation for love because in the Trinity there's community and relationship. I just wanted to add that in there. I'm an old attorney, so I think best on my feet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I can connect better with you. So. I'm going to begin with something I, will, I think will surprise some of you, and that is we also believe in a God who is God from all eternity to all eternity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Let me make a distinction that's very important, because when evangelicals talk about God, they usually mean the Trinity as a whole. Often, when LDS speak of God, we mean the Father of Jesus Christ, to whom all glory is given, and to whom we offer prayers in His name. So for LDS, we make a distinction there are some things that are true of the Trinity that are not true of the individual divine members of the Godhead. So, for instance, not only can Jesus Christ change, one cannot think of a greater change possible than going from very God to a human being. That's a change, if ever a change there was, to quote the Wizard of Oz. And so, what we're looking at will be some clarifications, okay? But just be rest assured. Now, there are two views in LDS thought. One, I think, was promulgated by Brigham Young, and that's that there's this time when the Father first became God, okay? And there's the other, where the Father was always God, and then had a time when he was mortal, and he was resurrected by Christ. Now, let me talk about something about the Incarnation, what it really means. The Father is said to be essentially bodiless, okay? He can't be incarnated because essentially he can't have a body. But the son not only did have a body, he died. It was a moral body. It can't possibly be the case that they're so different in their being that the father lacks capacities that Christ had. They would have a completely different nature. There's no way to make a coherent Christology when you have everything that we assert about God to be true that is false of Jesus Christ. We take Jesus Christ to be the preeminent revelation of what God is actually like. He's an exalted man. Now, that doesn't mean he's merely a man, because that's not true. The Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost have existed from all eternity in a perfect unifying relationship of free choice. They are divine because they made that free choice from all eternity. We have been divided into that loving relationship. And when we enter that relationship, we are everything that they are because they've shared everything that the Father is, the Son is, and the Holy Ghost is with us. We call that deification, or in the Orthodox tradition, theosis. Okay? And so what it comes down to is we believe that there's not two natures, a divine nature and a human nature, that are logically disparate and can never be brought together. Jesus Christ is the proof that's not true. It can't be true. And so what we believe is that we have a God who reveals himself when he becomes mortal. Now let me make another comment about creation next to Hill, okay? It is not the biblical doctrine. The vast, vast majority of critical biblical scholars, and even at least 10 evangelical scholars that I know personally, <laughs> teach that Creation out of a pre-existing chaos is actually what the Bible consistently and always teaches. The idea of creation ex nihilo entered the world actually in the second century AD. It's not the biblical doctrine. And anybody who tells you that it is, well, I suggest you go do some more research because it's not the case. The Dohu Wahalahu, which is what was held back by the Rakia in Hebrew, that means a shining dome. And what that means, it was holding back this chaotic water that was uncreated. And God separated those waters from the earth in creation. And the Hebrew word bara, which is the word used to create in Genesis 1 and numerous times thereafter, doesn't mean to create out of nothing. 
What that word means is to separate the pre-existing. It means to cut through it. That's what the Hebrew word means. And it makes a world of difference whether God creates ex nihilo or not. Because if God doesn't create ex nihilo, and in fact we believe that we too are uncreated, like Christ is, because he revealed not only the true divine nature, he revealed the true human nature. What that means is we can have a coherent Christology. I don't believe that evangelicals and, and Catholics and Orthodox can have a coherent Christology and it's not a biblical Christology. You'll never find the word Trinity, who's the art, or substance for the Trinity. You'll never see uh, consubstantial. You'll never see two natures in the Bible. It just isn't there. So I'm off. Did you want to ask a question? Did you want to do that? I thought I would want to do that. Aaron, you mentioned that uh, you mentioned that God creates the world ex nihilo. You mentioned uh, um, I, I didn't hear I didn't hear the the adjective timeless um, in your in your description. Do you believe that God is timeless? Uh, yeah, I would say God's outside of time. Yes, outside of time and therefore timeless. Yeah, because I believe that He would that it, when he, yeah He created time, space, and matter. Okay, I, I wonder why you why you would say that because I, I find that time is merely kind of an index of, of change, right? It's just a measure of change. Right. We say at one moment, you know, this was the, the X was such, and another moment X was another. And if God is to if God is to do anything, if He's going to create the create the universe, for example, for example, how can He be ad adequately described to times? Because we'd say the change came in the creation, not the creator. So the change. But the concept before that time didn't really exist, and it's not biblical. There's nowhere in the Bible where it says, well. Jesus had one divine nature, they had a separate human nature, they were never the same nature. In fact, there are a lot of evangelical theologians even who accept what is uh, a Christology where, where deity empties himself and becomes human, okay? Um, and so what we're talking about is one nature, a divine nature, it has the capacity to be human. And, and so, it, you know, we're not alone in this. I could give you a, a half a dozen evangelical scholars who, who accept that kind of a view as well. And so I don't, I don't think from the evangelical perspective it's, it's heretical. I just think it's a different way of looking at it. The biblical data never suggests that we have these two natures that are so disparate. What it suggests is that we have a human nature that's perfectible in God and that Christ is the revelation of what God is like. He's revealing to us God. And so I would suggest that the two nature theory of Christology is one that is not a biblical, and I've written a book where I've demonstrated that it's logically incoherent. And in fact, it's some of the greatest minds in Christian history have spent an incredible amount of energy trying to explain how it could possibly be that a, one single human could be the same thing as God, okay? Because they seem to be two very different things. And that takes, we're not going to resolve it tonight. I can't resolve it in two and a half minutes. <laughs> okay. We're even discuss it competently. Um, but th that's kind of the notion. Okay. 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 So um, so now uh, again, we're going to go out some different topics, and then you know you guys take notes and, and things, questions you want to ask. Uh, so now we'll move on to the question of in the each uh, religious tradition, what does it take for someone to get eternal life, whatever, whatever the highest is that you can get. With God, what is what is the requirements to get there? Yeah. And I'll start. I'm gonna on this one. Okay. Well, obviously, the latter Saint view of salvation starts with who God is, and that's why I, I was really glad that we started with that question. But uh, how can I put it? How can I put it straightforwardly? The latter Saint view of salvation is synergistic between us and God. Latter Day Saints do not take a very what we might call monergistic view of grace, for instance. We believe that our works and God's grace work in tandem in order, to, in order to bring about salvation. One of the operations of grace within Latter-day Saint theology is, that, is, is Christ's resurrection, which allows all men to be resurrected from the dead, regardless of, their, regardless of their works, regardless of their thoughts, regardless of the desires of their heart. 
that is one free gift that actually all we all get as 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 members of the human families that all of us will be resurrected from the dead. Now, now, however, not all of us will achieve the exaltation uh, that uh, Blake talked about, the deification that that will come. That only comes for those who reach what we call the celestial kingdom. We believe in a tiered heaven. There is the celestial kingdom where God resides, and the terrestrial kingdom and celestial kingdom. It's it's a it's actually an ancient concept. Uh, there's kind of um, there's kind of glimpses of it within uh, Second Corinthians and also within uh, within uh, kind of Jewish thought near near the New Testament period. Um, but we believe that um, our works and God's grace work work synergistically in order in order to in order to bring about our salvation and obviously mediated through the through the atonement of Jesus Christ who allows us to walk back to the presence of the Father. Um, there's much more to explain, but obviously that's uh, that's about as much time as we have to have for right now. So. so I'm going to use an evangelical, an evangelical um, vocabulary to explain this. Okay, we believe that we are justified by grace. I would equate grace with the unconditional love of God, accepting me just the way I am. But at the moment, I mean, and for a Christian, the moment of, of justification is very important, but it's far from the most important story, because for a Christian, the real question is, am I in the process of sanctification? And almost all Christian theologians believe that sanctification, that follows justification by grace, is a synergistic process. It's a combination of what we do and of God working in us. Okay. Um, so what we're looking at, saved by grace or justified by grace. Now, is it alone? The word bona never appears in Paul's words. That's the Greek term for alone. It appears only in one place. It appears in the epistle of James where he rejects the idea that it's by grace alone. Okay? That's the only time the word bona never appears in the New Testament in connection with justification. But it's not the notion that we can do it by ourselves or that it isn't by grace alone in this sense. God loves us already. Unconditionally, he accepts us. He waits for our willingness to turn to him to accept his love. And accepting love is not a work. Accepting love is what we do when we come to realize that we're loved because he loved us first. And then we begin on this process of sanctification. And so at the, at the end of the day, the process of sanctification is actually a process of growing in the light of God and in his glory. It is the process of theosis or deification. This is what Orthodox have spoken a lot about. But even theologians like Thomas Aquinas thought it this way. And so what we do is we begin in this process. We could call it deification where we grow in the light with God. Now, sometimes we slip and we lose weight. There's no question about it. Paul is very clear in Galatians 5 and 6. We can fall from grace. Once saved, not always saved. Because we have to beware. Lest we fall from the justification that we've received because we've rejected Christ and put him to open shame. And at that point, we will have rejected him and we will have fallen <coughs> from the grace that was given to us. And then, because we love Christ, we do what he asks us to do because we respect him and honor him. He's asked us to be baptized. He's asked us to spread his love to others. He's asked us to be his hands on earth. He's asked us to be the light that he reflects in the world. He's asked us to go into the world preaching to the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost and being baptized in their name. He's asked us all of these things. Now I could go on for a long time. But this is a shared treasure for us. Not a kind of bad one, I hope. So thank you. Well, I'm going to go back a little bit about like why we even need eternal life, and so um, why do we even need to be saved or have eternal life uh, when we know God created everything good, including Adam and Eve? <laughs> In Genesis, we read about how Adam and Eve um, and that they were perfect in a perfect relationship with God and were made to live with him forever. God commanded them to eat from the tree, uh, every tree in the garden, but not of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, or they would surely die. This death was a spiritual death, and because they did not trust God, they were separated from God. But God did not leave them there in their sin, but provided a way to be reconciled to him and so they could have eternal life. And then in Genesis 15, 6, we learn what it takes to get eternal life. 
our example is Abraham, and he believed in the Lord, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Then in the New Testament, he's used as an example again in Romans 4, 5, and in Galatians 3, 21. In the book of John, we also read what it takes to get eternal life. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And throughout the book of John, it says believe in him. You can look at John 3, John 4, 5, 6, 10, and 11. In Paul's writing, we find Paul is astonished that the Galatians are deserting the gospel for legalistic observance of circumcision. He tells them in Galatians 3, 10 to 13, that those who rely on the law are under a curse. Then in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, Paul tells us, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of work, so that no one may boast. So what does eternal life look like? Well, for those who trust in, in Christ for their righteousness and for their eternal life, we know we will live with him forever. But who is the we? The we is all who trust in him for his righteousness and the gift of eternal life. This is the family of God. This is our forever family. And you can read about that in Galatians 3, 20 to 29, and Ephesians uh, 2, 11 will come to yeah, I think this is good, um, and I think uh, it's, it's a, so it's Ephesians two a little bit. I think before um, James, forgive me if, if you did read this part, but I think this is really cool. So it says, um, okay, here we go. So verse four, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love which which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Kind of what I was talking about, you know, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So even when we were dead in our trespasses. He made us alive together in Christ. By grace you have been saved. And not only that, now check out verse 6. It says, And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And I, I would even share that not only are we promised, you know, relationship with God again, but we're promised that we're going to be seated with him in heavenly places, which is, which is a, a, an amazing thing to, to rest in and take hold of. Yeah, just maybe one last thing on that. We would say, um, I think a, a question that uh, we ask people a lot, because we think, uh, we ask this, we say, do you think right now, if, you, if you've trusted in Jesus, that the Father sees you as righteous as Jesus right now? And the reason why I think that's uh, an important question is because of our view of imputed righteousness and the view of, of positional righteousness that comes simply from trusting in Jesus. So 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, uh, for our sake, he made him who knew no sin, talking about the Father made Jesus who knew no sin, to be sin, so that in him we might have the righteousness of God. And so the idea is that on the cross, our sin was imputed to his account, and his righteousness was credited to our account, so that right now the Father can look at us and see us as righteous as Jesus. And that's why, I know this is not a, a Protestant, there are Protestants that disagree on this, but I think for us, or certainly for me, we would say, I would say that, no, I, I, I would say once saved, always saved. Because if I have Christ's righteousness, not because of anything that I've ever done, but because of what he has done for me, there's nothing that I could do to ever lose that. So my identity can be secure, is secure in Jesus in spite of myself, literally. Thank God for that. Uh, Genesis 15, 6 was mentioned as the point in time in which you believe Abraham was justified. Am I correct in understanding me on that? However, in Hebrews 11, it describes saving faith to him and his wife in Genesis 12, not Genesis 15, 6. And in the order solutions for salvation in cross and TL, as far as I understand it, only if you are justified do you actually have saving faith. So if Genesis 15, 6 is the singular point in time in which Abraham was justified, how do you explain Hebrews 11 and its use of Genesis 12? I'm going to go to read it because I don't have that one on the what, Can you say that again? Genesis, uh, Genesis, uh, Genesis 12 and Hebrews 11. Oh, I can't read all of that tonight. <laughs> can you just summarize what's in it? Well, in Genesis 12, Abraham is called out of his homeland mm -hmm. by God. Then yeah. he builds an altar, which and that sacrifice God will, uh, accepts. Mm -hmm. So this is not an action of an altar who's not justified. And in Hebrews 11, it and onwards, it says that Abraham. Abraham and Sarah had true faith. Mm -hmm. They're examples of faith. That harkens back, not to Genesis 15, 6, but to Genesis 12. So we don't actually support the idea that participation is an ongoing process, not simply being once for all the moment. 
Oh, you're asking if, if it's just one in time? Like, in like like a time, time. Yes, yeah. it's ongoing. Uh -huh. you yeah, we think it's just a one time. Yes, I've yeah. experienced Jensen's trouble where he has saving fates. He's clearly just my person. I mean, I think you, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm going to speak for Jane. <laughs> I, don't know. I think she would just—I um, think she would just say that the, the scripture says that he believed God and was credited in his righteousness. So, whenever that happens, we would say the idea is that it's when I trust in God, I think what she was saying before, Adam didn't trust God. That's how he lost it. And the way in which we always gain it back is by simply trusting in God. Different. Yeah, trusting in God. You know, now it's for us trusting in Jesus, but for Abraham, it was simply trusting in God for that. But he was not just fine before Genesis fifteen six in your view, correct? We'd say whenever he was, it was when he trusted in God. Yeah. Okay, I, I have a question. If you openly reject Christ, both verbally by going out and denouncing him, and then you go out and commit murder, hordos, and say the way blue babies, still saved? It's possible, you know, you're free, right? Well, yeah, so we, we, look, we say, look, we don't know, any, uh, that's between them and God, right? We don't know what anybody is saying. All well, you all, said once saved, don't we say I'm assuming that means that it's impossible to fall from grace. Right, so the question would be, so like Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, right, with the, and the 1 to 10 says that we're saved in 10, we're saved unto good works. So there's different views within Protestant uh, theology. Um, many people would say, no, if you are saved, right, then you would never do those kinds uh, of things. He said he sins all the time even though he's been saved, so I assume that that's not what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> But I think uh, like we probably all sin all the time. Am I wrong in that? Am I, well, am I the only one? Well, well then, I'm, I'm just asking. Yeah. I'm saying you, spin, you sin spectacularly. It's not that you can't sin after you've been saved. You've admitted you can. Yeah. So let's say you sin spectacularly and you reject Christ as a part of your sin. Are you still saved? Yeah, we would just say that the, the reality, if anybody has trusted in Jesus, position, I mean, I think, I can't get away from the positional language. Like, if that positional, I think it's certainly sin, and sin can end up singeing our conscience to the point where we can do un, un, unquestionable sins. But the question is, if we trusted in Jesus, and we've rested in, in, in that, that transaction has taken place uh, metaphysically, then I think that, that I'm the Lord's, you know, that, that, that never, I can never lose that. Now, now there, there are some Protestants that disagree with that, obviously. Well, that's, not a yeah, yeah. that's not a Protestant. That's not a Protestant. Yeah, questions? Yeah, a yeah, question for you guys. Um, so, the, you know, the idea of the celestial kingdom, kind of, can you say, like, right now, um, in light of Ephesians 2, how Christ seat, seats us in heavenly places with him, um, can you say that you're guaranteed celestial kingdom right right now, like today? No, because we no. believe we can fall from, from grace. All it, of us do. Yeah. What we would say is that we know that we've been justified in your language. We know that we are in Christ. We know that we're on the path, and we're striving to be on that path. But are we guaranteed that we're never going to do anything that would, you know, separate us from Christ? And the answer to that is we don't know that for sure. That's why we have to be aware and take care. And, and always check ourselves to make sure, because it's not the case that we could put Christ to open shame and remain in good graces with God. Yeah, I think, can you speak on the, the seated in Christ in heavenly places, how you would interpret that? Kind of yeah, that's in Ephesians, and what he's referring to actually is a halfway house in the, in the Greek um, cosmology, if you will. He's not talking about being seated at the right hand of God like Christ was. He's talking about being in a heavenly place which is <coughs> different than a celestial or highest kingdom. And what, can you expound, expound on that maybe? What, what is that? For, like, well, there are numerous studies on what this phrase by Paul means. And what they conclude is that in heavenly places, there, there were a number of heavens in, in Jewish thought. There were three in some uh, views and seven in others. And this would usually be the fourth heaven where the principalities and powers reside, which he refers to earlier in his text. Okay? The principalities and powers reside in the fourth heaven, not the highest heaven where God is seated. And so what you're referring to isn't being seated in a place where God is, it's being seated in, in a heavenly place, which is different, okay? So that's how I'd respond to that. Thank you. Can I ask one word of it? Is that too much time? What, um, how would, like, what would you say, like, 1 John 5, uh, 12 says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. I'll take this. Okay, sure. If you actually read the previous verses, he presents a series of texts. So the confidence one has is not an objective, but a subjective one. And also one should note what the apostles in the New Testament teach about their security. For instance, in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, 
Paul warns the Corinthian congregation that even he himself, Paul, could become a chemo studies in terms of reprobation. So we would argue you can have a confidence, but it's not an infallible assurance. Uh, one has to persevere until the very end. And we would say that's not a, um, a description of someone who's been elected, a la say, reform theology and some other theologies. That's something that one must strive to as well. So that's how we would interpret that. I would add that one of the most oft repeated injunctions by Christ is to endure. Endure to the end. That would be meaningless if we always endure to the end of your life. It's an injunction that's put to Christians. And it's important that we take care that even though we're Christians, we recognize that there are things that we can do that will separate us. But not only that, we can genuinely hurt people. We can be less than Christian. And we should never fall or allow that to happen to ourselves. That's why we've been adjured by Christ to endure to the end, because it, we might not. Okay, so um, so now we'll move on to the question of uh, a baptism. I know that like in, in Jane's presentation didn't mention baptism. So maybe like for Protestants, what does that mean? And you know, for Latter-day Saints, what does that mean? And so we'll take five minutes to talk about that. Yeah, so in light of kind of what Jane shared, what Jane touched on, I'd say no external act is necessary for eternal life. That would be the position. That, that's how we would read that the Bible teaches. You know, Acts 15, <laughs> Ephesians 2, Romans 4, you know, all through Romans, this idea of, there's no work that can that can do it. It's 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 faith, um, and so no. And, and in the light of that, so we would say that um, the Bible teaches water baptism is not essential for eternal life, but it is important. It's a good work. Jesus tells us to be water baptized. Every believer should be water baptized. But the question here that I'm addressing is it essential for eternal life? And we would say no. And part of the reason is that I would take us to Acts 10, right? So in Acts 10, you have Peter, the Apostle Peter, goes and goes to this guy named Cornelius, right? He's a Gentile, and, and there's a group of Gentiles um, that, that Peter shares the gospel with, he shares the good news with. And while he's sharing the good news, it says that the Holy Spirit falls on the Gentiles, right? And Peter's perplexed. This is amazing that the Gentiles now have an indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit, right? And then there's a, there's a, there's a break of time, and then Peter goes, can we not withhold water baptism? So we see two instances. We see a Holy Spirit baptism, and then we see a water baptism. What I'm going to kind of share is the moment a Holy Spirit baptism happens, what does that mean? What does that look like? And I'll take us to, um, for that, I will take us to Galatians chapter 4, 6 through 7, right? So it says, it says, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might, so that we might have adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God sent forth his spirit into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so you're no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, an heir through God, right? And so we would say that the moment a Holy Spirit baptism happens, you are, you know, you have faith in Christ, you are declared an heir, you're declared inheritance, you're declared no longer a slave, but a, but a child, a son, or a daughter. And, and so this is where we would say, you know, but then there's water baptism, and, and I, I, I would almost, you know, compare water baptism to being married, right? So I'm, I'm married to my wife. You know, and, and I have this ring to represent it. But if I take the ring off, I'm still married to my wife. I would, I would view baptism the same way. It's an outward expression of what's already happened internally. You know, and so, you know, even, even if a Christian, you know, gets baptized by the Holy Spirit, has faith in Christ, even if they didn't get water baptized from Galatians, we can see that they are still promised as an heir and inheritance in, in Christ. Um, the only the thing I, I would want to just also point out in um, in uh, 1 Corinthians 1, uh, Paul says, uh, he says, I thank God that I, bat that I bat sorry, uh, 1 verse 14, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my, my, my name. He says, I did, I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with the words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. So that's why for us we would say that baptism is important as sort of the first commandment for believers, but it's not something that would um, affect our uh, positional righteousness with Jesus. That that is, uh, as Jane read, sorry, Jane read from John, that happens when I trust in Jesus, when I believe in Jesus, and so we would say also... Like the example of like the thief on the cross is, is a perfect example of someone who did not get baptized, and yet to, Jesus says today 
uh, you will be with me in paradise. So important for believers, we'd say, as a, but not as a way to enter God's family. It's uh, simply a command for someone who has already entered God's family is now a son or daughter. Saints believe? Well, we would believe in what's called the doctrine of baptismal regeneration. And this is not unique to Latter day Saints. The vast majority of the broad Christian spectrum, Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, and most Anglicans and Lutherans even hold this view. In fact, Luther and Calvin taught it, and they did not believe it was a work of man, it was a work of God. And that's the Latter day Saint framing the work as well. Also, one um, correction to a common misunderstanding we do not believe that the meritorious cause of salvation is water baptism. That's a common caricature of the doctrine. We would argue, and we actually would agree with our um, dialect partners here, that the sole meritorious cause of salvation is the atoning sacrifice of Christ, merely. However, where we differ is the instrumental means of its application. We would argue it's not saving faith in the historic Protestant understanding of soul of day, it's actually done through the instrumentality of water baptism. So, why, as a Latter-day Saint, do I believe in baptism regeneration? Well, I can't really speak for my friends, but I think they would agree with me, is that of all the doctrines in the Bible, this actually has the most explicit witness to it. In fact, with respect to the perspicuity of Scripture and important doctrine of Sola Scriptura, there's actually more positive evidence for baptism regeneration than there is for doctrines we would agree with, such as the personal pre-existence of Christ. One example is the pericope in Romans 6, 3-7. Before I read this, let me just make a note that it's common for some modern Protestants, in my opinion, quite intended this to you guys, to claim that baptism in this passage is not water baptism, but it's a metaphor merely. However, this goes against the historic Protestant interpretation, Calvin, uh, Zwingli, Luther, the Heidelberg Catechism, and Ursinus was the main author of that catechism, their interpretation of the passage. But let me just quote briefly one modern Protestant scholar, I'm sure many of you have heard of him, Douglas Moo. By the date of Romans, baptized had become almost a technical expression of the right of Christian initiation by water, and this is surely the meaning the Roman Christians would have given the word. So in Romans 6, 3 to 5, we read the following. Knowing not that so many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that gar, like as our spirit Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, huto, we should also walk in newness of life. So in the symbolic view of baptism, baptism is similar to the relationship a wedding ring has to be married something which was actually used uh, fortuitously just a moment ago. It's an outward sign of something it did not actually effect as one being justified and in Christ precedes water baptism. However, Paul's theology in this passage is antithetical to this perspective. The apostle speaks of one being baptized into Christ, including being a partaker of the salvific effects of his death and resurrection, with water baptism in the instrumental means thereof. Let me quote a Baptist who himself does not believe in baptism regeneration, Stanley Fowler in his book, Word and the Symbol, commenting on the phrase, Ice Christop into Christ, which also appears in another baptismal text in Galatians 3. <coughs> it, the phrase, Ice Christop into Christ, is indicative of movement into saving union with Christ. R in Romans 6 7, the King James reads, For he that is dead is freed from sin. However, the Greek of this verse is not speaking of being freed merely, but actually justified. Paul uses decay apple, which is the verb to justify. So in Paul's theology in this passage, Romans 6, God not only simply frees a person from sin, but they are justified or made righteous through the instrumentality of water baptism. In Acts 13, 38 to 39, we have a similar so terminological that is salvific use of decay apple. Therefore, let it be known to you, men and brothers, that through this one forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you and from all things from which you are not able to be justified, decay apple, by the law of Moses. Joseph Fitzmaier, in perhaps one of the most scholarly commentaries on the uh, book of Romans in the modern era, know that. The other more likely explanation of this verse seeks to interpret the verb decay apple, not as free but justified, equipped in the genuine Pauline sense. The one who has died has lost the very means of sinning, the body of sin, so that one is definitively without sin. One has been freed of the fleshy sin from body, in other cases, a change of status has ensued, the old conditions have been brought to an end in baptism death, and a new one has begun. So let me actually address uh, Ephesians 2, because that came up. Ephesians is a parallel text to Colossians. You have to read both of them in conjunction. And if you read the Colossian parallel to Ephesians 2, 8 to 10, the instrumental means of salvation is actually water baptism. That's why the early Christians, to a man, believed in the unanimously and also believed it was the sacrament of faith. Colossians 2, 12 to 13, 
having been buried with him in baptism, in which we were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead, and you who are dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of, of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. And this is parallel to the text of Ephesians 2, uh, 5 to 6, where in both Ephesians 2 and Colossians 2, God has made us alive using the same verb, suzo pi eo, and raised us up, synergeo, which are, in light of Colossians, absolute texts. So this is why Latter day Saints believe it. It's the clear historical grammatical meaning of the text of the New Testament corpus taken as a whole. Thank you. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> yeah, so I would, I would just kind of, my question will be out. I'd love your take on kind of what I shared personally. You know, how there's the Holy Spirit baptism and then and, and, and Acts 10 and then in water baptism. And then coming out of the verse that I shared in Galatians 4, 6, and 7, what happens when the Holy Spirit indwells us? How would you maybe describe, yeah, or just your take on, on that? Well, with respect to Galatians, Galatians 3, 26 to 28 says how we're brought into the saving relationship through instrumental means and water baptism. Now, with respect to Cornelius, one can actually receive the Holy Spirit, but that's not the confirmation to use the modern nomenclature. Sometimes God gives the Spirit to people for a particular purpose. Uh, for instance, um, Sometimes God has given the Spirit to empower people with supernatural strengths, such as Samson to empower leadership and so forth. But there's also the issue of, was Cornelius saved prior to um, Acts 10, when he received the Holy Spirit? And it doesn't seem to be the case. You know, for instance, Luke implies that at this time in Jerusalem, Peter spoke to the apostles and the believers. Then Luke says regarding what Peter had said to them, when they heard this, they were silent and they praised God. I think God has given the Gentiles repentance of his life, but that's in Acts 11. So, I'm of the opinion, and Everett Ferguson and others is of the opinion, that the Holy Spirit was given in a special way to the Gentiles to convince Peter to baptize them. But in Peter's own teachings, Acts 2.38, he actually says, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. And that phrase does not mean you receive your uh, forgiveness of sins, then, you're, uh, then you uh, are baptized. Because the very same construction appears in Matthew 26, 28, where Christ says, this is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. So. Christ dies, that brings about remission of sins. You're baptized, that brings about the remission of sins in the same construction. And also Peter himself, in 1 Peter 3, 1921, says that water baptism is the antitype. That's right, now, uh, physical evil, water baptism being the antitype, the uh, fulfillment, if you will, destroys our personal evils, our sins. Okay, so your, your take on Acts 10, that, they, that, that pouring out of the Holy Spirit where they're speaking in tongues, that would be not a true baptism of the Holy Spirit, that's just a specialized case? No, because that would be like a, a splitting the baptisms, because there's no, outside that special instance about the conversion of Gentiles and trying to hit Peter over the head repeatedly that Gentiles are to be members of the new covenant, so that's still the way in Galatians and Acts 15. Mm -hmm. That doesn't seem to be regenerative. That seems to be God, because God can actually give that spirit to people even if they're in a non-regenerate state. That's, unless there's your hardcore Calvinist and you believe in absolute tea, I think everyone would agree with that. However, when taken as a whole, in light of Peter's theology, before and after, and the entire witness of the New Testament as well. As whenever water baptism is spoken about, it's never spoken about as a symbol. It's also it's always mentioned as the instrumental means of the application of the atonement of Christ all throughout. So I would say once you take the atonement scripture in perspective, that's how you should interpret the text. Thank you. Yeah. Could I add? We're not that far apart on this actually. You believe that if one has true faith, they are found in Christ. If they have true faith and are found in Christ, they're going to do what Christ asked. Christ asked us to be baptized. It's yeah. that simple. So no, I'm, to truly be found yeah. in Christ, we follow what he says and we're baptized. No, I agree. That's yeah. the, it's, it's, we should be baptized. Yeah. The question is, is it essential or not? You know, well, the idea essential is also, and also the mechanism by which it comes about, correct? I mean, is it is it God working through us to baptism, or is it kind of our own free choice towards towards baptism? And I believe that's kind of where we... I mean, it, whether or not it's essential to our salvation, that's one question, but also the instrumental, instrumentality by which, like, what, what agency is effectuating our baptism. Yeah, and, and the fact is that even for Latter-day Saints, not everyone has to be baptized. We don't believe that little children and those who are capable of understanding the law have to be baptized. Did we get questions done? Yeah, uh, two minutes from Latter-day Saints. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, in, in other Romans 6, we said that it uses the language of the United States. One second. Oh. <laughs> 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 Come on, Charlie. Connor's jamming out. It's all good. It's all good. It's all good. Okay. Well, I don't want to introduce anything new. So, with respect to 
Romans 6 treats of it, where, where the apostle says, true baptism, we're, 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 uh, we're recipients of the atoning sacrifice of Christ, we're united with Christ, and so forth. Clearly the language of justification and so forth. Um, how do you exegete or interpret that text? Yeah, so it's, it's funny. I actually taught on Romans 6 and 7 at Russia Christian this past week. So what you said, most Protestants believe in the, the phrase into Christ. I would argue that it's talking about faith into Christ, Holy Spirit baptism, what we see in Acts 10. With, and I, and my, my view would be that was a Holy Spirit baptism among the Gentiles, which then points to um, what I was sharing in, um, I think, yeah, Galatians where, where, yeah, yeah, Galatians 4, where it's we're sons, we're children, we're heirs, where that would be into Christ. Um, and so that's what I, what I take the Romans 6 to be, that into Christ would be a Holy Spirit baptism, specifically. But, but it could, it could, I've heard people say it could just be talking about talking about into Christ, but just the general idea of baptism. But I, I would, my view is that into Christ is kind of the Holy Spirit baptism. Uh, where's your point on the justification for understanding that baptism there is not water baptism or the ordinance baptism, but Holy Spirit baptism, separated from water baptism? Yeah, no, and I, I think the phrase into Christ, like what does that mean being baptized into Christ, you know, and, and that's, and that would be, my take on that would be the, uh, you know, the view that water baptism is an outward sign of what's already happened inwardly, and so, and, and, and does, am I making sense? I know what you're saying, and respectfully, that seems to be like putting the cup before a horse, so may, uh, maybe I should ask you another yeah. question. Um, with respect to, I, I briefly mentioned um, Peter's teachings, so how would you interpret, say, Acts 2.38, that says, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, and again, let me know, that phrase, for the remission of sins, appears in Matthew 26, 28. Now, I just kind of mentioned this, uh, because some, not all, but some calls this being, uh, for there is a causal. So, you repent, uh, you receive forgiveness of sins, then you're baptized. However, that does not make sense in like, the parallel construction in Matthew 26, 28. So, how do you interpret Acts 2, 38 in the Bible teachings? Because it's clearly yeah. water baptism in view, because they're immediately water baptized. Yeah, well, let's see if I can do that. If, if you guys, I'll, 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 I'll confer to the intellectual. Well, no, wait, 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 wait. I mean, I, I take the view that um, a, a Messianic scholar, a Messianic believer, Arnold Fruitbaum, who argues that, that Peter's talking to Jewish believers, and he's telling them that they have to be water baptized to separate themselves from the coming judgment of 70 AD. Uh, it's a physical judgment that's coming on them. So he's telling them that that's, they have their water baptism of being um, their allegiance with Jesus would separate them from that. And that's why he's giving there. We need, we need to talk about this. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Okay. Um, this is fun, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry to laugh. I wrote a book on it, man. I was going to say, he wrote a book on it. We haven't even read books on it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so last topic, then we'll open up for conversation, is we'll talk about, like, what is our final authority? Uh, and so, y'all will start, yeah. and then... Um, yeah. Well, the question actually is phrased, what are your authoritative sources of truth about God? And I think for Latter-day Saints, it's a, it's a concert, it's a concert of, of sources. Um, but uh, prime amongst those sources is Revelation. Now, of course, as Latter-day Saints... I think we can broadly accept uh, the terms that have been used in, in other circles, such as special revelation and general revelation, natural, natural revelation. Uh, but something much more, I think, uh, peculiarly Latter-day Saint is the concept of personal revelation and what, the con and what personal revelation actually, bring actually brings to us. Um, I believe that uh, it, um, Joseph Smith's view, as propagated within Doctrine and Covenants and within, and within the Book of Mormon, is one in which... The Holy Spirit can witness to us authoritative truths about God, but something about our being and the fundamental makeup of who we are as human beings resonates also with what, with what is being taught by the Holy Spirit. And as the Holy Spirit teaches us, we grow in something called light. All measure of truth that we attain has a corresponding measure of light or a subjective, a subjective positivity that it, bring, that it brings to our life. And so this concert of truth, um, including our being, with the teaching of the Holy Spirit and the increase of light that comes incrementally over time, lead us kind of incrementally to grow stronger and stronger in the truth to, um, to uh, unto, unto salvation and in, another, in order to in order to reach the celestial kingdom. Um, and so uh, I would say it's a concert it's a concert of sources including special revelation, general revelation, natural revelation, but more, most importantly, this personal revelation accompanied by the being. Our fundamental being, which resonates with the truth, as topic as topic of the Holy Spirit. Um, I know that my friend Robert Bullen has a lot more to say about this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, good to go. I'm further than the bridge. 
Uh, I'm going to briefly address what's called ecclesiology, that is the theology of the church, and also what's called binding or normative authority. Now, all people with the broad Christian spectrum, Latter-day Saints, various Protestants, will claim that they have personal existential knowledge of the truth of the gospel and scripture, however defined. You know, we all would claim that the Holy Spirit in some way witness to us in their lives or at a moment of time. So that's not uh, the issue for this. The issue, however, is not existential personal knowledge, but binding or normative authority of the church. Now, this contrasts with the historic Protestant view that privileges the conscience of the believer, not pretending they'd be negatively affected by the knowing effects of the fall, even after regeneration. Now, I thought we were dealing with Calvinists, so I would quote like an Arminian later, but let me actually quote Charles Hodge, who is representative of this view in Protestantism. This is from the Systematic Theology, and yes, I read Reformed uh, Confessions for fun. <laughs> what Protestants deny on this subject is that Christ has applied to any officer or class of officers in his church in whose interpretation of the scriptures the people are bound to submit as their final authority. What they affirm is that he has made it obligatory upon every man to search the scriptures for himself and determine on his own discretion what to require him to believe and to do. However, this privileged view of the conscious, as important as one's conscious ease, which is represent of the historic Protestant view, you see this with uh, Luther in his disputes with uh, Eck and others, actually flies in the face of the ecclesiology, that is the theology of the church, and its binding authority in the New Testament era. For instance, in Acts 15. In Acts 15, James, who is the head of the um, movement, the Council of Jerusalem, appeals to Amos 9, 11, the 12, in the Septuagint. However, the text in the Septuagint from Amos is used as Old Testament support for the belief that Gentiles do not have to be circumcised before entering the New Covenant. However, in light of the historical grammatical method of interpretation, the passage is solid about the cessation of circumcision, speaking only of the rebuilding of the Sukkot or Tabernacle of David, which was interpreted by the Council to refer to the Gentiles coming in to the church in verses 16 to 18. The interpretive or hermetical lens, if you will, that helped was not scripture alone, but Peter's experiences and revelation as recorded in verses 1 to 11. So here you have a synergy of scripture, modern revelation, and the binding maturity of the church on decisions. So in the, but in the historic Protestant view, one would have to ask, could a member of the early church deny, one, James's interpretation of Amos 9, 11 to 12, two, the teaching authority of the church itself, and three, the binding authority of the Jerusalem Council's decree, if they believed that through their own study of scripture, coupled with their informed conscience, they were for, uh, forced to arrive to a different interpretation of scriptures and to reject the church's teachings on this point. And if the argument, as James White and others uh, use when it comes to this particular text, whenever it's being pointed out to him, is, well, we're living in a different moment now, there's no public revelation. The onus is only present who would believe, and this is one of the building blocks of Sola Scriptura, that public revelation ceased at the end of the first century. Chapter, first exegesis of the text teaches public revelation will cease, and Jude 3 and Revelation 22 do not actually teach that, and maybe that will come off. So this kind of shows that Latter-day Saints believe in ongoing revelation, also, as the New Testament teaches, the binding authority of an external authority that's all, uh, living, that is the church as well. So this explains our high ecclesiology as well. Yes. Okay, so yeah, for Protestants, um, I think our view is, uh, as Robert said, is, is, is the idea of, of sola scriptura. So we would say that the Bible alone is our final authority in matters of faith. And so how, did, how do we come to that conclusion? Well, we think the evidence points to the fact that the Bible, uh, that we have what the authors wrote, what they wrote is true. Most importantly within that was the, the person of Jesus Christ as death, burial, and resurrection. And so Jesus is affirmed to be God. Jesus affirms in uh, his uh, Jesus affirms during his life both the Old Testament, but also we would say promises the New Testament. So in John 14, talking to the disciples, he says, "The Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will lead you everything and everything, and cause you to remember everything that I said." So that's why we would say that the apostles in the first century who walked with Jesus and wrote the Scriptures, um, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Um, have written the book, the Bible, right? The first New Testament, and then obviously the Jewish scriptures, the Old Testament, that we would count as our as our ground of all of our faith. So, uh, just a couple of things. Number one, the supreme uh, authority. We would say that the Bible then would trump, no pun intended, right, uh, over uh, anything that would be included. So, uh, so popes or prophets or anyone else that would contradict the Bible. No, the Bible is what we would go to. For, to answer those questions, uh, the sufficiency of Scripture, that the Bible is sufficient 
for all things that matter for salvation. So we can go to the Bible to answer those questions. And that would be, again, our final authority on those issues. Robert mentioned the perspicuity of the scripture or the clarity of scripture. We would say that, yeah, anyone can read the Bible and understand the the. The under, how someone is, comes to saving faith. Does that mean that we all agree on everything? No. Does that mean that there are hard passages? And they, they've even brought up some. These are hard passages that we have to, to reconcile. But you know, we, um, we would say, someone brought this up earlier today, um, in the main things, they are the plain things in Scripture. So in those main things, we think that there is um, clear teaching. And then obviously there's lots of things that are, that are hard. They're hard to wrestle with. Um, I think sometimes we think with, um, with Sola Scriptura, this idea that the Bible alone is the only thing we go to. We don't go to anything, uh, anything else. Uh, uh, we would call that, you know, that Solo Scriptura. We, we don't believe in Solo Scriptura, right? I mean, I don't go that to learn calculus or, or you know, math. There's lots of other things I could learn. I can, I can learn from other um, I can councils. I can learn from all those things. But it would, or I guess for us, we'd say the standard is if those things disagree, with the teachings of Scripture, then we are going to always side with uh, Scripture. Right? We, we see it in 2 Timothy 3.16 that all Scripture is God-breathed. Right? And that it's all Scripture is God-breathed. And so that is why we would say that it is our final authority. That, does that mean that um, God can't uh, speak to people now? No, we're, we're not saying that. I mean, there's some people who might say that. We're saying, no, we're not saying that. We're just saying that if anything that someone says, God said this, we would compare it to Scripture. If it, it, if it coincides with Scripture, we would just go, because that's what Scripture says. If it contradicts Scripture, then we would go against it, because we think, again, that the Scripture is the foundation of our authority. Yeah, yeah and the, the scriptures also tell us what a test of the prophet is in Deuteronomy uh, 18, uh, 20, 20 to 21. So, um, yeah, if you say something wrong, what did they do in the Old Testament? They were to be killed, right? So it's very, uh, it's very, se like, it's severe if you were to claim to be a prophet and, set, and got it wrong, you're to be killed. So... Uh, we have to take that seriously because there's a lot of, even within Protestant Christianity, people claim to be prophets. They get things wrong all the time, but like I guess God's grace, they, they don't have to be killed today. But you know they are false prophets. Yeah, so that's good. So I have a question. <clears throat> I assume that by the Bible you know, you mean the, the, the all the New Testament since we know them. Yes, sir. That didn't exist for the 300 years of Christianity. What did they were one? In fact, there were no scriptures at all from the New Testament for the first 20 years after Christ died. There were a lot of Christians. They believed they knew the truth. There were numerous books that weren't written for the first 100 years of Christianity that were not included in the canon. And for the first 300 years, it would be fair to say there was not a single Christian in the Greek world had the entirety of the New Testament. They would have had maybe a letter from Paul that, that would have been read to them once in church so that they knew it. Mm -hmm. And most of them wouldn't have ever heard even that. So what was the source of their authority? What was the source of their knowledge? Yeah, I would, I'd still say it was, you know, I would still say it was, it was that, you know, the, the, the word of God that they had, and certainly the apostles that were alive were, were able to, you know, again, I think the Holy Spirit inspired them to remember all things that Jesus had said so as their you know oral tradition that was being passed along as they're writing these scriptures i don't know maybe we talk about this another time but in my view all of the scripture was written um right early right it was within within by 70 a.d maybe except for revelation and maybe okay maybe we disagree on that uh yeah so i, I the gospel of john wasn't written until around 80 at, so, at the earliest now, all scholars agree on that that's all right yeah, virtually all <laughs> that's a big claim to say that all agree on that right i mean so, if you can find somebody who disagrees i'll i'm happy to Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. So yeah, I would. Yeah. So I would say that that is um, that. Yeah. That we have that. That we have early. I mean, I've got a book on my shelf. The, the redating of the New Testament. He's arguing for like I think an early date even for the like, <coughs> not, I mean, for the Book of Revelation. So um, yeah, that's. I mean, I think that's. Yeah, that's my But you would agree that for the first three hundred years, hardly anybody had a copy of the Bible. But I, yeah, I guess the, the question would be what the, the standard, though, didn't change, right? So just because somebody, I mean, there, there were copies that were going around, obviously they, they were being transmitted. They didn't even agree on what the books were until the council in about 311. 
But I would say, like, as written. soon as they were written, they are the inspired word of God. So we can disagree <coughs> on whether that is, but the, the, they are they are authoritative as soon as they are written. So you're so subject to something you don't know about? That I would be? No, the earliest Christians, they were subject to something they had no access to? But, yeah, I, mean, yeah, I, mean, I, I don't know how that would, yeah, I don't know how that would work. I just know that if, if as soon as the scripture, as soon as they wrote, I mean, if we're talking within, um, you know, 30 years, as soon as they were written, they are the inspired word of God, that that's what we can stand on. So we can disagree. I mean, I'm sure they disagree on lots of things, but to appeal, the, the final appeal would be, I think, to the written word of God. They didn't have it to be appealed to. That's why Paul wrote his letters as a practical matter, because as soon as he left, the people there didn't have anything to guide them, and they were falling into error, right? I mean, most of those letters are written to Christians who are just screwing up and putting things into Christianity that didn't belong there. Mm -hmm. They didn't have any written words until he wrote them a letter. They were there basically with the Old Testament and nothing else. I mean, we know from the New Testament that that's the situation. Yeah. So what are they What are they kind of doing? Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, it was, they, like you said, they would have um, they would have the 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 oral word that was being passed on from all you know from those that are passing on those until they got the written word. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I, I'm trying to think of how to how to how to phrase it real quick. Um, and kind of touching on on the idea of, of prophets and continued revelation. Now, would you guys, in your view of continuation of prophets, right? If it contradicted scripture or even contradicted itself later would that be an issue um and, and, and like i guess and even in your world what would you constitute as a, a false prophet um you know it can't it, be a simple contradiction of scripture matthew mark and luke teach that there's to be no divorce whatsoever no exceptions matthew teaches that you can divorce with an exception of adultery and paul teaches there can be a divorce only with the exception of adultery by a believer as a result, you get churches with a lot of different teachings about divorce. Those are contradictory in first order of logic. So if you want to talk about what's contradictory, I don't have to get beyond the New Testament to find something contradictory. I mean, just for you guys' as standard, just, you know, you, 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 we can talk about ours, but just for your standard of, if, if someone after Nelson said something that, you know, the next prophet said something that was contradictory, you know, maybe he said, um, adult, just hypothetical adultery is okay, would that be an issue or would well, you have to, well, yeah, just curious on what the standard Well, a couple of things. Like, first of all, we don't believe our leaders are inspired on a 24 7 basis. And in fact, for Latter day Saint doctrine to be formed, it's not simply like, say, Nelson or Joseph Smith says XYZ, even on the doctrinal matter. In fact, let me quote Brigham Young, um, you know, in trying to all matters of doctrine to make a decision valid, it is necessary to obtain a unanimous vice, faith, and decision in the capacity of the quorum. The first three presidents must be one in your vice, and then he mentions the 12 apostles being unanimous as well. And this is explicated in section 1 of 7 of the Doctrine and Covenants. So in our to the epistemology and framing of doctrine, um, there's checks and balances. You know, there's the ecclesiology, there's the need for unanimous consent among the tree of the 12, and that has to be presented to the church as well. So it's not simply like, say, even if you could find, like, say, um, George Albert Smith said, backpack crazy to him here, even if it's a theological fight, that would not be an issue for us anyway, because that's not how a lot of these same theology is formed. And we don't believe, again, our leaders are inspired on a 24 7 basis. And, and let's keep in mind, too, kind of like, there's two different ways in which I guess you could say that there's a contradiction, for instance. A prophet could be speaking without revelation and contradict something that is established doctrine within our scriptures, right? He could be speaking, he could be saying, oh, you know, we don't believe and we're not going to follow this particular part of the word of wisdom anymore. Coffee's okay for Latter-day Saints. How about that? What if that ever happens? <laughs> I, I doubt that will happen. But, <laughs> yeah. Dang, some of us would like it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a prophet, a, a prophet could, be, could be saying that, a prophet could say, well, coffee isn't, isn't against the word of wisdom. Well, that would be incorrect, because according to the word of wisdom is currently constituted by revelation through prophets, it, it, it is against it is against. The word of wisdom, right? Now, could a prophet come tomorrow and announce, you know, through the unanimous council of the church, we have received a revelation saying that coffee is now not, now not going to be against the word of wisdom. Yes, that could happen. Is that a contradiction? Well, um, it is certainly a change. Um, a, a contradiction, I, I think, might go to something more fundamental. A contradiction, a true contradiction, and in order to determine something as a true, uh, someone is to, uh, uh, a true or a false prophet, 
they have to go back to kind of a kind of eternal principles that undergird the the what what we might call the what we might call the prophetic tradition. What we might call the um, how does Jacob Hansen put it uh, in his podcast? I like, I like the way that he put it. It's the uh, it's the uh, collective witness model. Yeah, the collective the collective witness of the prophets. Thank you. There's kind of eternal moral principles that are revealed through the collective witness of the prophets, and if they're to contradict those. That's where I think a Latter-day Saint would be much more inclined to, to say that there, there was a false prophet. You know. so, so then that would be the final authority, then the collective witness of the product, the prophets, well, the, well, the base level? We would do it the way when Christ came, he changed the law of Moses. A more fundamental change one cannot imagine. But if God comes down and says, this is now my law, that's his law. And he can change it any time he wants. It's his law. And so what we view as binding now, if God said, oh, I was wrong. It, it, there, there are not three of us in the Godhead. There's also a council of gods. And by the way, in the council of gods, we're also going to have humans come. If, you know, we're just expanding. It's not a contradiction. You know, merely, an merely an expansion, right? But if he comes down and says, I can't know as God, uh, I'm really playing with you. I'm not. That would be a problem. So it's a matter of what is the nature of the contradiction. It's a matter of how fundamental is it. And we, I would say we have a hierarchy of authority. The scriptures that are accepted by common consent are the highest authority. But what's in scripture is often not clearly understood. We need interpretation, and where does the interpretation come from? A prophet or your best scholars? And that changes all the time, right? And under that, we would have the guidance of the First Presidency interpreting the scripture for us by current revelation and we would have statements that are made officially. Under that, we would have teachings like in general conference on a monthly, you know, on a, on a bi-yearly basis. And so, you know, they all have their place, but there's kind of a hierarchy of things that we would look to, and some are more binding and some are less. But God can make really radical changes in what he says, as evidenced by the fact the law of Moses got away. So, do you think hypothetically God could say more is okay? In certain circumstances, yeah. I have a question. But it wouldn't be murder if God said it was okay. It would be not contrary to the law, right? Okay. <laughs> it'd be killing. It'd be just. But so he wouldn't. Yeah. Well, we put people to death. We, I mean, we put people to death, but it's not murder because it's sanctioned by the law. I guess what I'm saying is, with right with the uh, similar understanding of murder, an unjust taking of human life, could he ever make that okay? I mean, if it's unjust, he would. He's, he's just, so he would never make it unjust. You can ask us yes, okay. So um, there are splinter groups within the the whole umbrella of Mormonism. How do we know which prophet is the right prophet? Pray about it. Pray about it. So there's no standard where you could actually check well, there outside are, of there are standards. Of, uh, there are standards of succession that are laid out. Oh, sorry. Right over here. Yeah, that's great. That's perfect. Okay. Sure. I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yes. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for a very, very interesting panel, uh, sincerely. I, I learned a lot. It was very engaging and interesting, so I appreciate all the participants and their perspectives. Uh, I have a question for my evangelical friends on this side of the panel. Uh, I would be very curious to hear your understanding or explanation for the, uh, since Aaron mentions the evangelical conception of God as one who is unembodied, who is outside of the physical world, outside of time and space, right? I would be very interested to hear your perspective on the explicit anthropomorphism of the Hebrew Bible in its depiction of God, in its conception of God. Yeah. Uh, the reason for that being is, as I survey the academic literature, the critical literature on the Hebrew Bible, there seems to be a very broad consensus interdenominationally that the, Hebrew, the authors of the Hebrew Bible aren't just thinking about God in anthropomorphic terms, they're describing him matter-of-factly in anthropomorphic terms. So here's a couple titles from just the last, oh, about 10 years or so. Charles Helton, Episcopalian, A Human-Shaped God, Theology of an Embodied God. Andreas Wagner, an Evangelical Lutheran, God's Body, the Anthropomorphic God of the Old Testament. Mark Smith, a Roman Catholic, Where the Gods Are, Spatial Dimensions of Anthropomorphism in the Biblical World. And Benjamin Summer, a Jew, from the measure, The Bodies of God in the World of Ancient Israel. So I would very much like to appreciate or hear your perspective on this. How do you, in light of Orthodox, I'll say, Orthodox evangelical theology that says that God is not embodied, is not in the physical material world. Uh, how do you square that with biblical anthropomorphism? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure my answer 
probably not going to, you know, you're not going to agree with it, but I think, yeah, I think that we're using human characteristics of God to help us understand a non-human being. So God is wholly other, right? He's, he's just, he's, he's not um, just us, only a little bit bigger. And so when they say things like, um, you know, his uh, arms are not too short, they're not saying he's got go-go gadget arms, you know, they're like, not really long arms, they're saying there's kind of, there's nothing he can't do. His eyes go all over the world or that's a paraphrase, but you know, it's not because he has human eyes. So I think they're trying their best um, to make sense of um, what God is doing and using it in terms that um, that uh, that we can understand. You know, human anthropomorphic terms. I think the when it says like I quoted earlier, God is spirit. Um, I think the question would be. Um, one side's going to have to say one's anthropomorphic or one's the other, right? And maybe, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. Uh, but in my view, we'd have to say that. And so the question, I think you're going to have a better, uh, a much harder time making sense, making that the anthropomorphic language and saying that he's, that he's physical versus the other and trying to just say that he's giving human characteristics to a, to a non-human being. Uh, if I may, as a quick follow, then I'll sit down, I promise, because I, I see there's a line behind me. Um, certainly, passages in the Hebrew Bible that you might take on a metaphorical level, right? God's hand is stretched out or so forth. I could see how that can make sense from a, a non-quote-unquote, non-literal reading. Yeah. Um, how do you make sense then of passages where it depicts a narrative level of God interacting in the physical world? So I'm thinking of Genesis 3, where God is walking around in the garden on a breezy afternoon, and Adam and Eve hear the sound of God walking. Yeah. I'm thinking of Genesis 30, when, when Jacob wrestles a man who turns out to be God. I'm thinking of Exodus 33, right. when God has to physically put his hand over Moses' face to stop him from seeing him. I'm curious how your understanding then interacts with these, again, narrative depictions of God entering in the, in the material mortal realm. Right? Yeah, yeah, I think that's, like I read earlier, John 1, the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, the Word Jesus. We see the Word, we see Jesus pre-incarnate all throughout the Old Testament, so I believe that it's the pre-incarnate Jesus who's walking in the cool of the morning in Genesis 15. It's actually the pre-incarnate Jesus, the Word, that appears to him, and it's actually carrying the, the smoky fire pot and the torch through the carcasses. So I think, and the angel of the Lord, I think, is the reincarnate of Jesus. So I think we see that all throughout the Old Testament, but it's the pre-incarnate sure. Jesus. Well, for what it's worth, I would basically agree with that. Oh. We're talking about the, the pre-incarnate Jesus interacting in the, in the mortal realm. So thank you for your perspective. Thank you. So Jesus, uh, we, we don't get a response to Jesus. I guess yeah. for time. Okay. Right. Uh, question for the evangelical friends. I'm also from the Bible Belt too, so. Okay. Hey, hey, that, that, that sounds like Alabama or Georgia. <laughs> I'm actually from Kentucky. No <laughs> way. Okay, my God. I'm from Kentucky. <laughs> um, so, um, one of the things that you mentioned, Aaron, that I wanted to ask for all three of you, um, you, you mentioned the, the concept of uh, of imputed righteousness. You know, other pro Protestants call it forensic justification. This idea. I think one of the one of the criticisms of that kind of doctrine that from a Catholic, Orthodox, and even those of us who are Latter Day Saints, we talk about how that that idea of calling something righteous that's not really righteous, call that making God a liar in justification. Yeah. Um, how would you respond to that? And then on top of that, how how do you deal with um, text as well as a secondary question um, about enduring to the end, as as uh, Blake mentioned, and the idea of Doing the first works in Revelation, needing to repent, being spit out of the mouth if the if the churches don't get in line, or Hebrews six even um, talking about it's impossible to restore again those who yeah. once been enlightened and then fallen away. How many questions? Was that? One question. <laughs> <laughs> One slash two. I think I understand, but just in case, can you repeat everything you said? Yes. Yeah. 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 No. Uh, Actually, I'm pretty sure he believes in the Trinity. He thinks that's just one question. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> <Read one. laughs> uh, so I am all the time. I got the second question. The first question just to the second. idea of. Um, for instance, for instance, justification, justification sorry, making sorry. God a liar yeah. in, in justification. Yeah, because we would say that um, it doesn't make God a liar because uh, Jesus really did pay that pay that uh, penalty for us. So at the cross, you know, it says like in Galatians, it became the curse for us. So they're really, they, we say, uh, people say for Protestants, grace is free. No, it was very costly for Jesus, right? So so in that sense, know that he, he did pay the penalty. God can't just forgive or he would not be yeah. just. So there was actual... Punishment. It was just God who, you know, found us guilty, then took off his robe and came down and stood in our places. About take that punishment for you. Right. Uh, and then for Hebrews six, uh, I take the position that again, I, maybe uh, Robert, uh, we were talking about earlier. Maybe wants to talk about this and disagrees with this. But I think that they're actually he's telling. Uh, there, there's two views, right? There's the view that they were never believers in the first place, 
Um, and that, that's a, a view that many people hold. But I believe that they were believers. I think the language there says they're believers. And I think it's talking, again, uh, Hebrews reading to Jewish believers. And it's telling them if they go back to the animal sacrifices, the Mosaic law, and they go back to after receiving Jesus, that there is no repentance for physical death. For them, they're coming under, the, again, that judgment that come, that's happening in 70 AD. Okay. So, thank you. Okay. So I have a question for both sides. So how come, why did God have to come become incarnate and die for our sins. Like, how come God can just forgive people? Like, why did the crucifixion of the something have to happen? Uh, I have a question. I've written a very long article on that. <laughs> very long book. Yeah, very long book. The short answer is that Christ learned by the things he suffered, and he truly learned by being a human being. God didn't have in his experience what it was truly like to suffer as a human, to be down with us, to be spat upon, and be whipped. And he became human because he loved us, to share with us our very condition. And he emptied himself of his divinity to share with us. And that made it possible for him. Now, do I believe that he did it for everybody? In one sense, yes, his resurrection makes it possible for every person to be resurrected. It makes it possible for us all to stand before a holy God to be judged for what we did. But it doesn't mean that we're all automatically forgiven. That must mean that atonement, in some sense, is ongoing because not everybody's already been saved, right? <laughs> that must mean that there's some ongoing notion of atonement. Um, and I'm not going to solve this here. I would urge you to go read the chapter, but... You know, last count, in just the past 10 years, there have been over 1,400 books written on the atonement by Christian scholars. And my response would be, God can just forgive us. The problem is that when he forgives us to enter into the divine life, it's painful to be in a relationship with us. It's painful to be in a relationship with us. We're painful. <laughs> and... Was his suffering necessary that we could be forgiven of sins? Again, yes it is because he participates in human life. And he takes into himself that human life to then make it divine because what he does in partaking of in human life, he then enters into our life and literally offers himself to us so that in the moment of justification, we are found in Christ in the sense that he actually indwells within us. His life begins to take up a boat within us according to the Gospel of John. And we begin the process of sanctification where we grow in the light and in participating in his life so that we reflect him to become more like he is over a process. And so the atonement makes it possible for us to let go and to begin a new life that is a co-shared life, an indwelling life. I think the word you use is co-inherence. <laughs> he co-inheres in us. And so is the atonement some kind of a legal transaction who is, this, who is this penalty owed to, I would ask? The answer is, we have the power to forgive each other without demanding a pound of flesh from somebody else. God does too. And so I reject the penal substitution theory. I think it is a morally reprehensible challenge. It was promulgated by John Kelly, and I don't think it ought to be the touchstone of Christianity at all. I would urge a compassion theory of atonement where Christ literally enters into our lives and suffers with us. So that's how I would respond. Does that, does that respond at all for you? I'm not sure it's it a big question. It is a big question. <laughs> if you, uh, if you'd like, um, there was a group of Latter-day Saints scholars that actually just recently published a whole kind of uh, book on this, actually, just called Latter-day, uh, let's see, um, what was it, what was it, the University of Illinois Press. Uh, Latter-day Saint Perspectives on Atonement. Latter-day Saint Perspectives on Atonement, um, which is Latter-day Saint, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. For, for some reason, they didn't tap him to write in that book. But, um, but, that, but that book is uh, phenomenal, giving a, a number of different views that are compatible with Latter-day Saint claims and, and theology about, explain, just explaining all about atonement theory and about why Christ actually had to come back. Yeah, and I would say, you know, God's characteristics, right? God's perfectly love. We would say that he's also perfectly just, right? We know the wages of sin is death. 
you know, Adam and Eve sinned and they had to be cast out of the garden because of their sin. You know, they, they weren't perfect. They couldn't be with God. He had to, he had to remove them from that. Um, and and I, that's the, I would say that's, that's the gospel is that Jesus took that penalty that we deserve. Isaiah says it was the will of the Father to crush him when it's describing Jesus. And so, I mean, that's, that's, that's harsh language, but it was the will of the Father to crush him because something had to be paid for. We, our sins had to be paid for. Um, and we would, we, I, would, I would answer that God is perfectly just. And so the only way that our sins can be paid for is he put our punishment on Christ. But that would be our. How is that just to punish the only innocent person in the whole history of the world who didn't deserve to be punished in the place of those who do deserve it? How is that justice? It was the will of the Father to crush him. He willingly went on the cross for well, you that. You said it's just, and I'm asking yeah. how that's just. Yeah, well, I mean, you can call that justice if you want, but for me, that's a yeah. miscarriage. Well, if it's, I would, I would argue if that's not the case, we're in trouble where we're at, um, because then we're, we stand guilty before God. But yeah, but that's our answer. Yeah.